Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Welcome to our live class today. We're very excited to have you here and looking forward to a great lecture. My name is Anthony and I'll be your host. I'm joined on the line by Dr. Janu Patel, who will be conducting most of the presentation today. I'm going to pass it off to her momentarily to kick off today's presentation on the topic of your PCOS toolbox, the functional approach. So we're really excited about this one, and I'm sure you are all going to learn a lot. But before we get it started, I'd like to quickly get your feedback on what topics you would like to learn more about. So please take just a moment today to participate in this poll uh, on your screen. It just will take just a moment. And, you know, we, we're very interested in helping you learn more about various topics which can help your practice. And again, a reminder, all of your answers come in anonymously. So don't worry about what anybody else can see what you put. Um, so yeah, just take just a brief moment to, to fill out that poll for us so we can get a, a really good idea of how to benefit you further. So it looks like we have a majority of people filling this out. Thank you so much for participating in that poll. So I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items in addition before we begin. I've muted everyone by default. And number two, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them into the chat panel. The questions will come to me as the host, and I'll be conducting a live Q&A with Dr. Patel at the end of today's presentation. And lastly, we'll be hosting a live demo at the end of today's live class with our head of practitioner partnerships. So for those of you who are new to Rupa Health, feel free to stick around if you'd like to learn more about how we can optimize your practice. For those of you who are already using us, thank you. And if you need to get back to your practice or your day, feel free to hop off. So with that being said, I'd like to hand it off to Dr. Patel to begin the presentation. Hi everyone, um, my name is Janu. I go by Dr. Patel to most, but Janu for all of you today. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about PCOS. Many of you might have already had a lot of experience with PCOS, whether you're treating patients uh, in that category. And some of you may want to actually nerd out with me a little bit about the science. So we're gonna jump in here and um, kind of go over the objectives for today. We're gonna explore the diagnosis, the workup, the treatment of PCOS, how to counsel patients regarding diet and nutrition, and then sort of go over or highlight some evidence and data regarding functional labs and supplementation. So just to start, we wanna know um, what is PCOS? Because when you're educating patients, you wanna have a grasp on what are the different variables of PCOS. So it's one of the most common hormone abnormalities of reproductive age women almost 10% of women suffer from the syndrome. And the characterization of PCOS is actually around not only androgen production, but also phenotypic uh, stimulation too. So the overproduction of androgens such as testosterone plus menstrual abnormalities when ovulation does not occur and enlarged ovaries containing multiple follicles is sort of the premise of what PCOS is, but it is actually very much more complex than that. Most common reason for um, people having irregular periods is PCOS, and almost it's responsible for 40% of female infertility. So the causes, there's a lot of speculation as to what is a pinpoint cause of PCOS. Now 20 to 40% of women with PCOS actually have a mom or sister with this condition. So they are linking it to genetics. However, there's a multitude of other variables that we have to consider as well. So inflammation is a huge factor. Multiple infl inflammatory markers such as CRP, IL-18, um, MCP-1, and WBCs are actually present in women with PCOS. Food sensitivities, infection, thyroid dysfunction, and stress all need to be talked about when evaluating PCOS as well. Insulin resistance is tremendously significant in PCOS patients. 65 to 70% of PCOS patients actually have insulin resistant at some point in their disease. 70 to 80% are considered obese and 20 to 25% are considered lean. So there is no one, one shoe fits all or one hat fits all for PCOS. 
we have to talk about the spectrum. And that's why I've listed the phenotypes of PCOS as well. There's actually four types or subclasses. The first one is where a patient can actually present with irregular ovulation with hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovaries in um, an ultrasound setting. The second one can actually have just hyperandrogenism and irregular ovulation. The third one, which is type C, has the androgenic features, um, whether it's labs or phenotypically, and the polycystic ovaries. And the last one is just irregular ovulation and polycystic ovaries with no hyperandrogenism, which, which I'll go into in a second. Now, there is another type of PCOS, which is OCP-induced. So when women are on OCPs, they can tend to um, gain weight from some of them um, based on their metabolism. So the adverse metabolic effects causing insulin resistance and increased long-term risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease actually comes from medication-induced. And then the last one is um, thyroid dysfunction. So this is actually more prevalent in women with PCOS. It's not a cause of PCOS, but thyroid dysfunction can inhibit ovulation by affecting FSH and LH, um, which are ovarian hormones. Increased TSH can lead to increased adipose tissue, which can then lead to inflammation and insulin resistance. So when you're looking at this as a whole, you have to understand that there's no um, diagnos diagnostic criteria that can say which type you are. Instead, we actually have to say, people can move through these phenotypes in various parts of their lives. So clinically, um, I'm an internist. And so I see a, a multitude of uh, patients right now aging from 18 onwards. A lot of what I do is in the realms of women's health and hormonal testing as well. So when do I think about PCOS? I go through an extensive history and physical exam before getting to the diagnosis of PCOS because a lot has to be ruled out first. So the three things that we really look for that are a commonality for PCOS, the first one would be hyperhydrogenism. So we use a modified Ferriman Galway score, which I'll show you in the next picture. Um, it's essentially telling you what are the characteristics physically to describe that someone has high androgen levels. The second criteria would be ovulatory dysfunction. So unpredictable menses that occurs at less than a 21 day or greater than a 35 day interval. And then the last one is morphological features. So this is currently defined as 12 or more antral follicles, about two to nine millimeters in diameter in either ovary and an ovarian volume that is greater than 10 milliliters in either ovary or both. The modernizing criteria. So a lot of institutions have been in battles for many, many decades actually to understand what is the significant criteria that we should follow as practitioners. So dating back to 1990, um, the US NIH um, PCOS diagnosis was basically saying that it should be based on chronic lack of periods or anovulation plus signs of high androgens. The Rotterdam criteria is one of the most popular ones that we use in our clinical setting. And that actually started, uh, it came out in 2003 and basically told us that we should have two of three major symptoms, either high androgen levels, polycystic ovaries and irregular menstrual cycles, two out of the three to, correct, to actually diagnose. Noticing here, you can actually diagnose PCOS without even a lab report. The third one, the Androgen Excess PCOS Society in 2006, basically said high androgen levels and ovarian dysfunction, that's basically all you need without the irregular menstrual cycles. So here we have an overlap. There's a lot of um, conflicting criteria and data in history of diagnosing PCOS. So we actually start to say, let's piece these together and use them all in the proper clinical setting. So I talked about the Ferriman Galway score. So um, this is basically a picture that we would use in our clinic to identify um, the severity of hirsutism. Um, so a score of one to four is given for nine areas of the body. A total score less than eight is considered normal. A score of eight to 15 indicates mild hirsutism and a score greater than 15 indicates moderate to severe. A score of zero indicates absence of terminal hair. This is a very um, delicate subject for patients, especially ones that have been suffering from PCOS their entire lives. 
not only do they have to deal with uh, weight fluctuations that they don't really have control over, um, but they also have to deal with uh, body hair that they can't get rid of with uh, laser treatments or oral contraceptive pills to a terminal end. So um, when we're talking to patients about this, it's very important to talk to them with a lot of sensitivity around the subject. So how are insulin resistance and testosterone correlated? Again, going back to um, talking to a patient, we really want to mind PCOS is basically an umbrella term. Underneath that umbrella, there's a lot more we have to uncover. So insulin resistance basically means your body is less able to send glucose into the cells needing fuel throughout, throughout the body. So in turn, the pancreas actually starts to produce even more insulin just to keep those glucose levels even. All of this excess insulin can basically negatively affect your reproductive system by shutting down your ovaries. And this leads to higher levels of androgens, including testosterone. So it's almost like this vicious cycle that they have to battle. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is another hormone that we have to talk about. PCOS patients have approximately 40% increase in gonadotropin releasing hormone, pulse frequency. This happens almost 90, every 90 minutes to hourly, which can lead to an increase in LH secretion from the pituitary gland. And this in turn can cause increased ovarian androgen production. You're starting to see how different hormones and different enzymes are starting to raise up these androgen levels. And overall, the, the phenotypic expression that we, we um, see in PCOS patients is all from this androgen level. Increased gonadotropin releasing hormone and LH pulsatile nature in PCOS probably actually result from the cumulative effect of altered GNRH stimulatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. So this affects serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and acetylcholine in the hypothalamic pituitary center. The hypothesis, therefore, is that this actually may cause depression and anxiety-like mood disorders commonly seen in PCOS by throwing off this axis. So why do PCOS patients suffer infertility? This is a huge debate and huge question, um, and it's also a significant reason why patients go to fertility specialists. Unfortunately, we're catching this a little bit too late and women are starting to approach their mid thirties to late forties when we're talking about fertility. PCOS can be diagnosed way earlier than that. So the reason why they suffer infertility is because androgens are being produced in many different areas. So elevated levels of androgen metabolites basically inhibit the granulosa cell proliferation. Elevated AMH, which is the anti-Mullerian hormone can inhibit follicle growth. And then insulin being at high levels can arrest the cell proliferation and follicle growth as well. So this is just a triad of disasters for fertility. And what we need to understand is we need to actually reverse the PCOS. We need to bring down the androgens to allow for fertility to proliferate too. Going back to the insulin. So 50% of PCOS patients suffer from insulin resistance. I wanna talk a little bit about the serine phospho phosphorylation. So this process, excessive serine phosphorylation of the insulin receptor occurs more in PCOS patients than it does with people that don't have this disease. Serine phosphorylation uh, basically modulates the activity of key regulatory enzymes of androgen biosynthesis. This single defect produces both the insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism in some PCOS women. And now recent studies are showing that insulin is acting through its own receptor rather than the IGF-1 receptor in PCOS. So this basically augments ovarian and adrenal steroid genesis, as well as pituitary LH release. So this, this negative uh, biofeedback loop is altered because of the serine phosphorylation. And in turn, we're dealing with more insulin resistance, therefore more adrenal steroid genesis. Um, so that begs us the question, are we over or under diagnosing? In the world that we're living in with also the diet that we're living in too in, in America, there's a lot of different variables that, is, that are causing obesity, hormonal changes, thyroid dysfunctions, and infertility. So we're a little bit cautious in delivering this diagnosis, especially in the teens to early 20s, because some of these symptoms are actually a normal part of puberty. 
with the irregular um, cycles. Androgen excess especially can actually take time to develop. So that's another problem. We can't actually talk about the hirsutism unless it's actually expressed and that takes some time to express. Early diagnosis, however, can help us with normalization of menstrual cycles, restoring fertility or talking about fertility and protect against PCOS related comorbidities such as diabetes, heart disease and endometrial cancer. So again, why so elusive? Um, there is another condition called non-classical congenital adrenal dysplasia, and it can closely mimic PCOS. So the test that we order normally um, to rule, rule this out as a cause is early morning, early follicular phase plasma level of 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Um, when it's less than 200 nanograms um, per deciliter, it effectively rules out 21 hydroxylase deficiency and should be a part of our checklist when we're working up PCOS. So some of the helpful labs, again, to rule out other causes of oligomenorrhea um, or amenorrhea. The first one be, would be um, pregnancy. So urine and blood HCGs, especially if this is relatively new to the patient and they're in their reproductive years. Hyperprolactinemia, um, so just a simple prolactin level. Hypothyroidism, so TSH and free T4 are great labs to order here. Ovarian failure, um, the antimullerian hormone, which we talked about before, is also an important lab. And then um, hypogonadism, so hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So we would order a testosterone, FSH, LH, TSH, prolactin, and estradiol. Other rare adrenal tumors that we could look for, um, we, uh, we can actually do a hyperadrogenism panel for this. So looking for adrenal gland tumors, abrupt it's actually abrupt, rapidly progressive or severe hyperadrogenism. So it's not as slow growing as PCOS. So this is actually when your total testosterone levels is above 150. In PCOS, your testosterone levels can be elevated but usually not to that degree. And then the last one is testing for um, Cushing syndrome and acromegaly. This should be considered in women with other clinical features um, of Cushing's. Um, and acromegaly, which I won't go into today, but the usual helpful test for that one is 24 hour urine um, cortisol level. So the labs they may, may, that may be increased in PCOS, um, the first one would be increased free testosterone and bioavailable testosterone, um, which is the same thing, increased DHEAS and DHEA, increased LH and normal FH, or FSH, sorry, increased estradiol, increased estrone, increased fasting insulin, increased insulin resistance, so we would measure the fasting sugar and A1C, increased liver enzymes in patients presenting with um, NASH, mildly elevated prolactin, decreased sex hormone binding globulins, and elevated cholesterol. Now, understanding what type of testosterone, I was mentioning bioavailable before. Um, total testosterone assays are relatively inaccurate at the lower levels detected in women. So the T levels are lower during menses and vary by 25% during the follicular phase with the highest levels in the early morning. So the one that we actually um, calculate is the free testosterone with the use of measurements of total testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin. Because free testosterone is the most sensitive test for hyper hyperandrogenemia in women, with PCOS, but the direct free testosterone is actually notoriously inaccurate. Um, so therefore, when you're getting your testosterone panel, look for free, look for total, and understand which one, which one is more useful for you. And I would say, take the total out, out of the equation and actually understand where the sex hormone binding globulin is coming in there too. So should we be counseling on heart health for PCOS patients? Absolutely. In a recent meta-analysis, triglycerides and LDL, which is your low-density lipoprotein cholesterol levels, were 26 milligrams per deciliter and 12 milligrams per deciliter higher. Um, and the HDL, which is your good cholesterol, was about six milligrams per deciliter lower in women with PCOS than controlled. This basically means it makes it a lot tougher because we're adding on cardiovascular disease now to the PCOS spectrum. So, the reason why you're all here is understanding the functional lens. So understanding the root cause analysis. Now that we've gone through the scientific portion of PCOS, 
we really need to understand how to talk to our patients about PCOS in a functional lens. There's a lot of patients that come to me that say, I don't want to be on oral contraceptive pills. I don't want to be on metformin. I don't want to take any medication. Help me with my diet. Help me with my lifestyle. Is this reversible? Am I going to get, uh, am I, will I get pregnant? So the things that I look for on a, on a functional lab platform is definitely starting with your fasting glucose, your fasting insulin for insulin resistance. I also look at the homeostasis model of insulin resistance, so the HOMA IR um, test as well, because this gives me a pretty accurate gauge of insulin resistance. The HS or high sensitivity, high sensitivity CRP is great for looking at whole body inflammation. And Dutch testing is actually great for ruling out all the other causes that we talked about all the way down to Cushing syndrome. GI map for gut imbalances is really crucial because of the level of adiposity or abdominal um, obesity that PCOS suffers from does propagate cortisol levels as well. And cortisol in turns can create a stress reaction in the gut microbiome. So the GI map, I use that for major gut imbalances and actually talking to them or talking to patients about their relationship with food. Symptoms that we want to also acknowledge. Um, so we talked about excessive hair growth, weight changes and trouble losing weight, the ovarian cysts, really low libido. Um, you can actually have low or high libido based on the testosterone levels. Um, irregular or missed periods, male pattern balding um, or thinning hair, high testosterone levels, insulin resistance, tire, uh, tiredness or fatigue, acne, mood changes, and troubles conceiving or infertility. So management-wise, non-pharmacologic for hirsutism, it is really difficult because it's almost six months um, is the lifespan of a terminal hair follicle, and therefore laser therapy usually doesn't um, present as the most effective method. Um, so what I do recommend to my PCOS patients is usually going for electrolysis if it is in their budget. Weight loss and glycemic control, as well as lifestyle changes with diet and exercise is a huge component for hirsutism as well. So going to diet and nutrition, um, the things that I tell my patients mostly is stay on a high fiber diet um, with avoiding high glycemic index foods minimizing saturated and trans, trans fats. Um, and then foods low in ages, uh, the pronunciation or the acronym for advanced glycolation end products. These are things that are found in beef, pork, poultry, cheese, butter, processed snacks, opting for soy for phytoestrogens and avoiding animal protein. Animal protein has actually been found um, to be inflammatory for women with PCOS and it also propagates increasing um, insulin resistance as well. So adding good quality soy to the diet actually has better phytoestrogens. So soybeans are highly selective and have anti-estrogen effects. It's great for women with PCOS. Um, most oftentimes women will say, I don't want uh, soy because that will just make my, me have more estrogen and it will propagate more um, fat. And so this counseling is super important in understanding what a phytoestrogen is and telling them that good quality soy is actually good for you. Cutting down on alcohol and caffeine. Um, this basically interferes with absorption of nutrients and one standard alcoholic drink can actually strip the gut lining and is really dangerous for the um, liver. So we wanna take down or dial down on the inflammation in PCOS. So both of these can propagate that. Don't fear your food and eating. Um, mental health is a huge component of PCOS, like we talked about, not only on a microcellular level of changing uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and acetylcholine, but dealing with this um, syndrome comes with a lot of depression and anxiety of, can I go out in public um, without makeup? Um, will anyone uh, judge me for being obese? And I've, I've been trying so hard to go to the gym every day. There's a lot of mental health awareness that we need to bring to the syndrome. And so talking, up, talking to your patients about, have you seen a therapist? Do you want to talk about how you feel? Um, all important things. So psychologically, we need to actually start incorporating therapists into PCOS plans. 
foods to avoid. So refined carbs, um, sugary snacks and drinks, inflammatory foods, um, sucrose, high fructose, corn syrup, and dextrose. Whenever I have a consultation with a PCOS patient, I actually go through every single thing that is in their fridge, their pantry, and even their Uber Eats account. Um, we go through things like um, packaged um, coffee products that say zero sugar on it and look at the back and actually go through the fine print because a lot of this is just awareness and education. Hooking up your PCOS patient with dietitians and nutritions is even going further beyond to helping them too. Mobility, 150 minutes per week of exercise is usually recommended for PCOS. And per the Academy, uh, Academy of Nutrition, protein at all meals and snacks, so nut butters, fish, tofu, beans, lentils, and low fat dairy are also helpful. So going to the science part, um, in 2017, there was a review published and it noted basically a favorable dietary plan of women with PCOS should contain low amounts of saturated fatty acids. This comes to no surprise for us because we know that this also turns down the inflammation as well. Sufficient intake of fiber rich diets from whole grains, legumes, vegetables, fruits, with an emphasis on carbohydrate sources with low glycemic index is highly recommended. Part of what I also say is, you know, the vegetables that grow below the ground have a little bit higher inflammation, high starches than the ones that grow above the ground. In 2015, anti-inflammatory diet study um, for PCOS showed 100 overweight women with PCOS ate a reduced calorie diet for 12 weeks. The diet consisted of five small meals with 25% proteins, 25% fat, and 50% carbohydrates. The diet was designed to include moderate to high amounts of fiber, with an emphasis on anti-inflammatory foods such as fish, legumes, green tea, and low-fat dairy. Um, so basically they removed or they limited chicken, red meat, and added sugars. And the mean weight loss was 7.2% with significant reductions in cholesterol, blood pressure, and fasting blood glucose. The levels of CRP were actually measured and they were reduced by 35% after this trial and 63% of women regained menstrual cycli cy cycles back. So this is, this is phenomenal because it's actually showing purely with diet and lifestyle modification, there was significant changes on a cellular level down to inflammatory markers and a phenotypic level of actually gaining your menstrual cycle back. Going to the pharmacological side, um, this is pretty well known. Um, there's no single oral contraceptive pill that has been approved by FDA for the treatment of hirsutism. And that's the unfortunate part. We're still, in, we're still knee deep in research to understanding how do we lower these androgen levels with a medication? Um, because the medications that are out there, they do reduce the androgen levels, but the hirsutism is not something that can permanently be removed just with the medication. So OCPs, the combined OCPs, which include progesterone and estrogen, they suppress LH-mediated ovarian and androgen synthesis. Um, the ethanol estradiol increases SHBG, the sex hormone binding globulin, and that can actually in turn reduce the free testosterone. That's how it works for hirsutism. Third generation progestins have actually less androgenic activity compared with second generation. And androgen suppression or blockage with medications um, kind of help with slowing of new hair growth. So those medications are reserved kind of as a third line for people that are suffering from severe hirsutism. Um, I've just listed a few more. Um, so spironolactone is a very popular one, um, popular anti-androgenic medication that is used in conjunction with an oral contraceptive pill. Metformin um, reduces serum androgens, so it's effective for insulin resistance and PCOS. And um, Basically, adolescents with PCOS that were randomized to metformin or spironolactone basically showed both improved hirsutism, but spironolactone had a greater, greater benefit. And a recent meta-analysis of four trials specific to adolescent females showed that OCPs and metformin were similar in terms of effects on uh, hirsutism. All right, and then going to acne, which is another, um, another problem in PCOS, for medication-wise, you can start with estrogen-containing therapy. Spironolactone, like I suggested, also hits two birds in one stone, acne and hirsutism, and oral antibiotics. The thing is, um, the most women that I've 
treated with pharmacological agents with acne, they in turn start to suffer from gut microbiome um, dysfunctions as a side effect. So the non-pharmacological advice that I usually give is lower your, lower your saturated fats, processed carbs, dairy intake, and animal-derived foods, hydrate up to 2.5 liters of water daily, get six to eight hours of sleep, start on a magnesium supplementation, and either choose between a plant-based or Mediterranean diet and start to cleanse your um, cabinet from non-toxic cleansers and serums. Fertility, so 80% um, of anovulatory fertility, infertility cases is from PCOS. Most of the time we start with lifestyle changes. So weight loss has a dramatic effect on fertility, starting folic acid and then stopping tobacco and alcohol usage. Pharmacologically speaking, you can use um, clomiphene or letrozole. Um, both of these lower estrogen in two different pathways. Letrozole usually works on the aromatase inhibitor enzyme and clomid uh, works on blocking the receptors in the brain. And per randomized control studies, when compared letro comparing letrozole to clomid, letrozole had a higher live birth and ovulation rate amongst infer infertile um, women in PCOS. Now supplements is a big hot topic right now in PCOS, especially with myo-inositol and dechiro-inositol. I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but fish oil, vitamin D, N-acetylcysteine, acetyl-L-carnitine, magnesium, probiotics, zinc, B12 and folate, and coenzyme Q are usually the supplements that I have on patients that I've seen actually regain menstrual cycles and also have higher fertility successes. The unfortunate part of this is the research is not yet robust, but if you look at what these supplements are, they're all lowering inflammation. And we've already talked about the stem or the root cause of PCOS dealing with inflammation. Inositol. So this is basically a type of sugar molecule. It's produced by the body found in naturally in foods. It's, it is known that a healthy myo-inositol and d chiro inositol ratio, it actually varies in different tissues of the body. In women with PCOS, the ratio is higher than normal in peripheral tissues, but lower in follicular fluid or ovaries. So this, this is where it really matters, the inositol in follicular fluid. When they measured it against healthy women, they had almost 100 to one ratio where PCOS patients had it 0.2 to one ratio. Um, so that's why this is sort of the hot, hot topic right now because inositol is also showing to improve insulin sensitivity. And research is showing that PCOS patients have naturally lower inositol levels. So supplement, supplementation may help promote ovulation and pregnancy rates. Combinations of the myo and the DCI in the ideal ratio of 40 to one is usually the dose that we recommend. And again, the catch is the mechanism is still not fully understood or published. Therefore, it is linked to glucose and insulin sensitivity. So we definitely need more research in this area. So lastly, what else do we want to screen for when we have a PCOS patient? The first thing, because we're dealing with obesity in some of the phenotypes, o OSA, which stands for obstructive sleep apnea, it is basically characterized by brief but repeated pauses in breathing during sleep caused by relaxed muscles that let your airways close for a few seconds. This may result in heavy snoring, daytime fatigue, mood swings, memory loss, waking, and heart disease. So you want to add this a part of your questionnaire for PCOS patients. Um, the research that has been done at Harvard Medical School and the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism showed that 30 PCOS patients have um, 30 times the risk for OSA and nine times more likely to feel fatigue during the day from poor sleep. Type two diabetes is another one. We talked about insulin resistance. It's four times higher risk in PCOS. Um, half of all women with PCOS develop prediabetes or diabetes before reaching the age of 40 years old. So this develops pretty swiftly within, uh, with five to 15% of women with PCOS moving from normal blood sugar to developing diabetes within three years of diagnosis. It's huge. And then, like I said before, don't forget about the brain. I always start off my physical exams with any patient asking about their mental health. I know I'm an internist, I'm not a psychologist or a, ther or a psychiatrist, but it is something that is super important to ask because this is a syndrome. 
it is a syndrome without a definitive cure. So we must ask um, about fertility. Uh, we also must screen for endometrial hyperplasia, cancer, talk about glucose metabolism, dyslipidemia, OSA, depression, and anxiety. So a couple take home points. Um, it is an elusive and complex syndrome. Uh, lifestyle modifications is a solid foundation for counseling. There are pharmacological and non-pharmacological tools to help mitigate the symptoms. Regular lab work to monitor for insulin resistance, cholesterol, and hormone regulation is important. And fertility awareness at the beginning of the diagnosis is very important as well. So keep a clean food palate and clean mind. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. That was great. You took a really deep dive into this topic today of PCOS that, you know, so many women are suffering with around the world. And I think having this knowledge, I think will really help practitioners with their patients. So thank you and great job today. So we received a lot of questions during the presentation. So we're going to just dive right into the Q&A. Uh, so let's start with question number one, and that is, can people with PCOS get pregnant? Yeah, so um, that's a really common question. PCOS patients can get pregnant, actually. And I've had a, a number of patients. Um, sorry, let me open the screen up. Uh, I've had a number of patients that have gotten pregnant and said, wait a second, I have PCOS. I never get my uh, cycle. I can't get pregnant. And the thing is, is that you can still ovulate. Um, there are phenotypes where you're anovulatory and you're, you're not having periods at all, but you can still get pregnant. So you want to counsel PCOS patients, especially adolescents, um, just in case they are not looking to get pregnant to be on an oral contraceptive pill. Very interesting. Moving on to question number two, is there a genetic test for PCOS? So unfortunately, um, we talked about genetics, but there is no specific um, genomic marker that is associated with PCOS. So there's no single candidate gene that actually has immersed as a convincing biomarker. And again, it's an emerging tool of research right now. Such a fascinating topic, genetic testing. Uh, moving on to question number three, what diet have you seen to be the most effective in your PCOS patient population? Sure. Um, honestly, it's been a whole food plant-based diet. Um, I've, I have seen in my practice, and I've dealt with a lot of infertility cases as well, between a paleo, um, keto, and a whole food plant-based diet. And most of my patients, almost 80% of them actually regain their menstrual cycle when they switch to a whole food plant-based diet. And this is even for um, the phenotypically lean PCOS patients as well. Very interesting. Okay, question number four for you, Dr. Patel. What specialists or team of practitioners would be helpful to uh, build essentially for each PCOS patient? So what I normally do is I, Right off the bat, when PCOS is diagnosed, I actually get um, a dietitian or nutritionist on board with my PCOS patient. Um, this is mainly to go through things that I may not have enough time to run through with my patients. So going through their entire diet, um, setting, up, setting up a whole plan for them and a dietary journal. So that's the first one. A reproductive endocrinologist is actually also very important if they are in reproductive age and if they are looking to get pregnant even if that means five to 10 years down the line. This is actually to bring even more awareness. Um, endocrinologists in general are super helpful in this department in, in laying out the foundation of the pharmacological components of treating the different complex parts of the disease as well. So between endocrinology, reproductive endocrinology, and nutritionist and dietitian, those are my foundation. And I usually, when I talk about mental health, I get a psychologist as well. Thank you for that. Very interesting. And looks like we have time for just about one more question uh, for you, Dr. Patel. And that is how often are you performing labs on your PCOS patients? And can you dive a little bit deeper into those labs? Sure. Um, the labs that I actually pulled up before um, in the presentation. So I usually do every three to six months of um, cholesterol and uh, fasting sugar levels because we talked about how fast uh, insulin resistance can occur in PCOS. 
so they can go from um, normal blood glucose levels and doing exactly the right diet to um, pre-diabetes very quickly. So I bring them back every three to six months for that testing. I usually include also a thyroid function test. Um, I don't regularly test their androgen levels because once you're actually diagnosed with PCOS, there's no data to, to suggest that whatever you are doing um, uh, for medication wise that you need to regularly monitor, say for example, testosterone levels or DHEA. It's great for an initial evaluation, um, but it doesn't need to be uh, regularly monitored. Very interesting, very fascinating. Um, thank you for all of those questions. And, uh, everyone who submitted and thank you, Dr. Patel for answering all of those questions. I know we weren't able to, we weren't able to get to everyone's uh, question day. So if you have any additional uh, need, any additional information, please reach out to us after this live class. So thanks again for attending today's live class. Huge shout out to Dr. Patel for the presentation. Great job. Great topic. This was really, really interesting. Um, so we hope to see you all at the next Clive class. But before you leave, Adrian Martinez, who is our head of practitioner partnerships, is going to jump on and hold a live demo for you right now. So if you'd like to learn more, please stick around. And Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. He is uh, jumping on here in just a second. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to him. So as soon as he is ready. Hey there, how's it going everybody? Uh, Dr. Patel, Dr. Anthony, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Um, my name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner partnerships. Uh, just real quick, Dr. Anthony, I think you got to make me a host in order to allow me to share my screen. So sorry about that, uh, Adrian. I thought I was, uh, there we go. It looks like we promoted you. Hopefully that should work. All right. Thanks so much. I, awesome. So appreciate that, Dr. Anthony. Thanks for, so much for having me. Um, and Dr. Patel, that was an uh, amazing um, presentation. So thanks again for, for sharing on that topic. For those of you who are familiar with Rupa Health or not familiar, if you are interested in sticking around for about 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to do a quick deep dive into uh, our platform, who we are, what we do, and why we're hosting these live classes uh, just about every single week. So again, just to reiterate, my name is Adrian. Um, what I'd like to start off by doing is just chatting about what Rupa Health is, right? Um, Rupa Health is a lab test ordering platform. We are designed to modernize the way that you would traditionally order your lab tests and manage that entire process, honestly. So what we've done is we brought on 20 plus different labs onto our platform, allowing you as a practitioner to place an order, manage your results, view all those results, send them to your patients uh, from all of our different partner labs in one place. Whereas traditionally you would have to go to each individual portal to do these things, right? So really expediting and making things more efficient and effective for you in your practice operationally. The second thing that we've done is we've built out an end-to-end -end patient experience. So when you think about the patient experience, when it comes to these functional lab tests, there can sometimes be a lot of handholding, not only when it comes to actually questions regarding the tests, but hey, how do I fill out my requisition? What we've done is we've built out an end-to-end -end process that can include us managing the billing for you. We offer multiple different payment options, as well as the option, for, of course, for you to pay for those tests and manage billing separately. We'll send over our own curated FAQs and instructions. If the patient has any questions along the way, we'll actually manage all those questions for you so you don't have to any longer, right? We'll even manage the specimen issues. We can manage the phlebotomy. Right. So if there's questions regarding phlebotomy, if you yourself can't do phlebotomy, right, there's oftentimes a lot of questions that goes along to it, along with that. You know, how do I take that or how do I get my blood draw? Where do I go to get my blood draw? How do I cost? Again, we'll manage that entire process for you. From there, you're alerted as the results come in and you're able to view all those results within Rupa Health. So what I'm at right now is rupahealth.com. And I'm actually going to share my uh, contact in the chat real quick. So if you have any questions or want a more personalized uh, demo or call after the fact, feel free to put some time on my calendar, shoot me an email. I'll follow up with you straight from there. But let's hop into it, y'all. So what you're viewing right now is the Rupa Health dashboard. 
what I want to first and foremost show you is just really how simple it is to place an order on our platform. So up here on the top right where it says start order, this is where we'll go ahead and do that. To start an order, we just need three bits of information. We need the patient's first name, last name, and email address. From there, we collect everything else directly from the patient. We do this for a couple of different reasons. The free, first reason is to one, make things more streamlined for you as a practitioner, right? And the reason number two is to ensure the, the accuracy of the information. Patient's information can change. They can move addresses. They can change phone numbers, you name it. So we'll collect that information for those reasons directly from the patient. The first things that you're seeing here on this ordering screen is your bundles. So here at Rupa, you can actually create custom bundles. A bundle can be a set of tests. It can be a set of blood panels. It can be a combo of blood panels and tests from any of our various different partners. What that allows you to do is place an order for all of your different bundles, um, one click, and all of your tests are added into your cart without having to go through the entire catalog to find specific sets of tests that you're gonna order for a patient. Below that, you'll see your favorites tests. So a Fravich test is an individual test that you're most commonly using. You can put a little heart next to it. And that way, those will be among the first tests that you'll see. And so that way, again, you don't have to search through your entire catalog to find these tests that you're commonly using. And it's just one click. They're added into your cart on the right-hand side. If you are looking for a specific test that is outside of a bundle or a favorites, you, of course, have access to the entire catalog down below. You can search for specific companies. You can search and, sample or, or, and filter by sample type and then do a little search here within that search bar for that specific test. Over here on the right hand side, you'll be able to see all those tests that were added into your cart. If there's an add-on test available for that test, we'll make that very transparent. You'll just click that button. It'll pull up the details of that test. It'll show you things like turnout times. You can download a copy of the instructions that we'll send to the patient, a sample report. If there's biomarkers, we'll show you all those as well. But it's as simple as clicking onto that add-on test to add that test onto the GI map in this example. All of our tests will be defaulted to be drop shipped directly to the patient. You do have the option of having uh, an in-office kits with uh, six of our different uh, lab partners. But again, in this day and age of uh, you know virtual uh, appointments and telehealth, a lot of our practitioners just prefer to have that as the drop ship option. It'll also default to having the patient invoice directly for your order as well, for their order rather. We offer multiple different payment options. Beyond cash and credit, we can do HSA, FSA, as well as a three-month interest-free payment plan. But if you do choose to pay for the tests, which a lot of our practitioners might prefer, you can go ahead and add that option here by clicking that box, add your payment information. It'll save it into the system so you don't have to do this on every single order. Of course, with that option, it would be up to you to manage the billing separately with the patient. You can add notes for the patient. Things such as, you know, if they're continuing, if you want them to continue to take a supplement while their testing is going on. Notes for Rupa. We work with practitioners who, for example, maybe want the results faxed over to them. You can add that note to them or note to us, and we'll see that and fax those results over to you. And ICD 10 codes. So if the patient wants to submit a super bill to insurance after the fact for reimbursement, you actually can add ICD 10 codes directly here. Uh, so we can go ahead and say gastro, for example, it'll bring up a catalog of ICD 10 codes with that keyword in it. You'll be able to add them straight away from here. From there, it's as simple as clicking send a patient and the, the order will be sent directly to your patient straight from there. So again, that's how simple it is to place an order on Rupa Health from any of our 20 different lab partners. Just takes a minute or so. Next, I'm just gonna show you how you track all your orders. So within this main dashboard here is where you'll be able to track all of your orders. You can search for specific patients. You can run filter by results or by status, excuse me. So we'll update the status of all of your orders as it moves along, right? So again, you're not gonna to have to check into every single portal to view the results and the status of your orders. It'll be right here transparently within the Rupa Health dashboard. I can filter and say, hey, here's all my pending payment orders, meaning these are orders that are sent to the patient that they haven't yet paid for. Let's see what's going on with Joe Smith and Connor Lawrence. We sent them these tests on June 1st. They haven't yet paid for these tests yet or move forward. Let's follow up with them. Not only is that good for the patient experience, having you know uh, just a direct contact with the practitioner, but of course it's good for your business, right? If they're going to go ahead and complete these, pay, uh, these tests, that means they're going to follow up with you. You're going to be able to continue to have uh, a relationship with this patient. You're able to click into any of these in-progress orders as well, hopping in and clicking in you'll be able to see, hey, these test results arrived at the lab on June 1st. We're expecting. Hey, everyone. If you're still on the live class today, it looks like we're just having some 
technical difficulties on Adrian's side. Sorry about that. I'm going to, in case he's not able to join back in, I'm going to put his um, direct contact in the chat box again. So feel free to shoot him a direct message, email, um, and uh, he will be able to get back to you with any uh, answers of your questions, as well as schedule uh, further live demos for you if you're interested. So thank you so much for attending today's live class. Um, I'm not sure if he is able to be back. We'll wait just a second. Let's see if he if his internet is able to jump back on. I think we've all dealt with that before. So let's just give him just a second to jump back in. And here he comes. Perfect. So I'll give him just a moment to, to hop back on. There we go. Hey, everyone. I have no idea what just happened there. My computer just completely shut off. So my apologies about that. Um, jumping right back into everything, I believe we were just going over how simple it was to actually track the progress and status of your orders. Let me jump back in real quick. Again, apologies about that. No clue how that just happened. So once you get that uh, email that the results are in, you're able to click into your Rupa Health dashboard. And again, you're able to view all of your results from all of your orders in one place without having to go to each individual portal to do so. You can download the results. You can send them directly to the patient from here. One thing that's very important to note is that we will never send the results directly to the patient without your consent. You have full control over that. From there, you can schedule a clinical consult as well directly with the lab. So if you need some additional assistance interpreting the results, you're able to hop in here, schedule a clinical consult directly with the lab and of course view the requisition should it be digital and again just to you know harp on it one more time all of your labs one place you can view them order them all from Rupa Health. Um, you can view all of your different options here within the lab test catalog you can see all the labs that we're working with on the left hand side all the tests that we have to offer on the right hand side you can run filters searches whatever you need to do you can filter by sample type as well um, clicking into the details will show you of course as i showed you earlier all the details of that test biomarkers turnaround times you name it um one thing that's really important to note as well is that we with Rupa, you don't need to create a separate account with each of these labs. So meaning you create one Rupa account and should you have the proper licenses, you'll be able to order from all of these different accounts without having to go through uh, the process of creating an account with all the labs, right? We have access, of course, to support anytime. We have both practitioner support as well as patient support. So we'll manage all the questions directly. Um, you can adjust your settings within here, creating your custom bundles. The support center is an extremely useful tool. You'll be able to find all your FAQs, all the information that you need. The search bar is very handy. And of course, this will give you access to all the live classes. So just a quick shout out to Dr. Anthony and Dr. Patel. You'll be able to hop on here and get a uh, recorded copy of today's presentation should you have missed some of it. You'll be able to view all of our upcoming classes then any previous classes as well will record and you'll be able to watch all of our classes directly here um, within the uh, support center. So last thing I want to show you just very quickly will be exactly what the patient experience looks like. So just jumping right in. This is a timeline of what the patient will experience. So as soon as you place that order on Rupa, your patient will get an email notification from us. The kits will be shipped out within 24 hours of us receiving payment. We'll send over those FAQs and instructions, check in with the patient, and then uh, once again, you're notified as the results come in. Here's an example of the communications, should you be the one, or should, should us be invoicing the patient directly, right? Hi, Joshua, Dr. Jordan has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are. We'll highlight the different payment options that we accept. So again, not only just cash and credit, but we accept HSA, FSA, as well as setting up a three month payment plan directly with the patient. We'll collect all the necessary patient information to complete the order, demographic information, billing information, shipping information, and then highlight the test that was ordered for them over here on the right-hand side. Should you decide to pay for the order, right? We'll still, of course, reach out to the patient. But we're essentially just collecting shipping and demographic information at that point, right? We're not going to highlight the cost of the test or show them anything of that nature. We'll show them the test that was ordered. But should you be the one paying for the test, we will not show the patient exactly how much that test cost. That's completely up to you to share that information and then bill the patient separately. We'll notify once the order has been shipped out. And then this will show you exactly what the communications will look like 
once we uh, send those over to the patient. So this is an example of the Dutch complete test over here on the left-hand side. We'll show you what that email communication will look like with the instructions. We'll walk them through how to fill out the requisition. And then should there be a blood draw necessary, we'll send over options based off of the lab that they're working with. Uh, but if you do have a preferred phlebotomist, we can take that information and we'll send that information directly over to the patient. Should they not be able to work with any of the phlebotomy options that were sent over them, they can reach out to us and our team and we'll actually work to find the best and most suitable options available for them. And again, just to reiterate, should they have any questions at all regarding their tests, they'll reach out to us and our team and we'll make sure that those questions go answered for them. Um, from there, you're notified as the results come in and you're able to view them all within RUPA. That is my short and sweet, uh, quick high level demo. Should you want a more personalized demo with me, feel free to reach out. I'll drop my information again, just uh, in the chat. I'm not sure if I got lost when I got logged out, but it's just Adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N at rupahealth.com. Feel free to reach out directly to me. I'm more than happy to schedule a call um, with you and your team, should you want to. Um, but with that, y'all, happy Friday. I hope you have a great weekend and thanks so much for sticking around.